Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to Encounters with Confederate Flags and Monuments with Modube Labodi. I'm Jenny Chamberlain with Beaverton City Library. Um, this event is part of the library's community-wide reading program, One Book, One Beaverton, which this year is in celebration of the book, The Final Revival of Opal and Nev by Donnie Walton. To learn more about the program and the associated upcoming events, uh, please visit our website at beavertonlibrary.org slash one book. Um, this presentation tonight will be recorded and posted to the library's YouTube channel in the weeks following this event. Um, if you have questions for our presenter, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit them rather than the chat. Um, she'll answer as many of your questions as there's time for at the end. And if you're on a mobile device, just know that um, sometimes you may need to tap your screen to make those buttons appear at the bottom or the top. Okay, um, our presenter tonight, Modube Labodi, is a curator of African American social justice history at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. She has taught history and museum studies at Iowa State University and Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis where she was also a public scholar of African-American history and museums. She was also the chief historian at the Colorado Historical Society, now History Colorado. Modupe's areas of interest include histories of monuments and commemoration, black public art, African-American history of the Midwest and West, and public interpretations of black history at museums and public history sites. She received her undergraduate degree from Iowa State University and her doctorate in history from Oxford University. And now I'll turn it over to you, Modupe. Um, thank you so much, Jenny. It is really wonderful to be here and um, to be with you through um, Zoom. I think that many people are tired of Zoom, but I'm finding this really great that I can uh, participate with you now. Um, so I, one of the reasons I kind of jumped at the invitation when Jenny uh, made it is that I love reading, love history, love talking about thing, monuments. And um, after reading the last revival, the final revival of Opal Nev, what I thought it'd be interesting to bring together two things. Um, one of them is just kind of asking what a smart young black girl like Opal and her sister Pearl would know about Confederate flags. Um, what did Black people think about Confederate monuments and flags in the 1960s? And second, bringing together some of the research um, I've done with colleagues, which is um, also about how Black people responded to, engaged with, and sometimes challenge, directly challenge Confederate monuments in their midst monuments and symbols in their midst um, from the, um, th throughout the late 19th and early 20th century. So um, with that in mind, I will actually start a PowerPoint. And um, I hope if you have any problems seeing it, um, please let me know. And um, sorry, I'm gonna start. I'm sorry to do this to you, but I'm going to stop share for just a minute so that I can um, not start it in the middle of things. And let's see if let's see if I can start sharing the screen now. Okay, so hopefully you can see this and um, the encounters with Confederate flags and monuments. And I probably should have been, um, is kind of specified even more how African Americans have viewed Confederate flags and monuments. And um, one thing that I need to make clear is that I'm speaking on my own behalf, not as the official position of the Smithsonian Institution. Um, so this is a scene of a kind of typical Confederate monument in a fairly small town, Livingston, Alabama. As you can see, the, um, there's a lot of the Confederate ba battle flag. There's the, the monument in the middle and children probably dressed up, probably um, maybe, maybe it was a, a Confederate Memorial Day or 4th of July, some sort of celebration. Um, this monument is right, it looks like it's in a, a town square. 
So you can see the commercial buildings toward the back, um, lots of really beautiful trees. And um, partly because of the nature of the picture, the only people you see here are white children. So Confederate, I won't go through the whole history of how Confederate monuments were established, but they started emerging um, in the late, in the about around the end of Reconstruction. So the 1880s in small towns and large cities throughout the South. They were almost always sponsored by women's organizations, sometimes very large organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, but sometimes much smaller organizations. And they did a lot of work, um, even though they may not, some of them were more elaborate than others. What they did was demarcate space, um, use, often if they were in a park in a small southern town or a large southern town, that park would be whites only. So it's also noting who is in charge, but it's also repudiation of the, um, the end of the Civil War. Um, these monuments, the Confederate monuments, often supported ideas um, that have sometimes been called the lost cause. And the lost cause was promulgated in books, in plays, in, um, in uh, kind of in music, as well as formal history books and politics. And explain. And the lost cause had several premises. One of these um, was that the Civil War was not fought over slavery, that Confederate soldiers were chivalrous and gallant, that that white, white Southern women were known as Southern bells. They were embodiments of a certain type of femininity or ladyhood, that black people were better off as slaves. And when black people had actually governed in the, during reconstruction, it showed how incompetent they were. So under going, underpinning all of the lost cause is, is white supremacist, a white supremacist belief as well as a justification for um, white control and um, white and the white supremacy ideology in public life in the South. So what tends to happen is oftentimes how black people responded to that, this, new, this ideology, which really held sway through the 1880s to 1950s. Um, very, it was a very flexible ideology. Um, the, how Black people responded oftentimes isn't really discussed. And I like this image so much. Um, this is an image by Dorothea Lange um, when she was working for the federal government in the Farm Service Administration. You might know her in pictures from the um, so-called migrant woman, uh, picture, migrant mother. She did a lot of pictures in the South and she was really struck by the Confederate monuments she saw everywhere. Here it's directly in front of a courthouse. Um, you see it's, it kind of blends in with the columns here. And in the foreground are several um, African-American adults kind of talking, chatting, um, but it may have been a market day. It may, people seem to be dressed um, fairly nicely. Um, so it may have been a Saturday where people came in to do their shopping, but this shows just kind of the everyday life of the Confederate monument. So although some people's claimed that they, they kind of never really saw it or never really thought about it, for black people, they were operative. They often kind of were about Jim Crow, but also a host of other things that many, that black in individuals and institutions such as churches and newspapers um, oppose. So in order to get the, um, how African-Americans responded to Confederate monuments. A lot of oral history and memoirs are very um, important, very useful. And so I'll just give you a few examples. Um, one of them is the John C. Calhoun monument in Charleston. Now, John C. Calhoun was a um, statesman. He had run, he had made an attempt to be the vice president. Uh, many people said he was the intellectual force behind the idea of secession, saying that Southern secession was constitutional as opposed to an unconstitutional act. And he was an enthusiast for slavery and white supremacy. 
So when he he died in 1850, after the civil after the Civil War, after Reconstruction, the ladies a, a ladies association for the Calhoun Monument formed in Charleston to create the monument you see here. Um, so John C. Calhoun is standing in the front of it on the top of this kind of squat pillar and the woman below is supposed to be justice. And this is a really intriguing um, image because you have these uh, African-American, um, mainly it looks like women and girls. Um, there's a few boys in the background who are in front of this big public square where the um, monument was. So what they were doing, why they were photographed, it's not quite clear. Um, but what we do know was that this monument was not popular amongst Black people. Um, almost immediately, th that people started mocking it. The mocking was um, the talk, talk called the woman justice, um, Mr. Calhoun and his wife, um, kind of implying that he was a, you know, he believed women should be kept in their place below him. Um, they also, um, there were people who threw rocks at it, who threw stones, they spat at the monument. Um, this was taking, opposing a monument in this way, in such a physical way, was often quite risky because attacking the monument um, was also attacking the, the current power structure. And one of the things that annoyed many of the city fathers, and I'm emphasize fathers of Charleston, was that um, black people were mocking it. And they were concerned that they would, by extension, that they would be mocking or not taking seriously the white leaders. Um, one woman who was born, who was just a child, um, I'd say six or seven, when the Calhoun monument, um, this monument was erected, um, she said, she recalled, we used to carry something with us if we knew that we'd be passing that way in order to deface the statue. Scratch up the coat, break the watch train, try to knock off his nose. Children and adults beat up John C. Calhoun so badly that the whites had to come back and put him way up high so we couldn't get him. So if you were, if you had a good arm, you probably could throw a rock here and watch at Calhoun. And I think the other, what her statement makes really clear is that they wanted to beat him up and beating up an, a, a, someone who was so esteemed by white Charlestonians intimated that the white, that black people were still in control of their ideas, of their minds. And um, what Mamie alluded to was actually true for reasons that were not formally stated the ladies uh, says Calhoun Monument Association ended up taking down this monument and putting up a new one. And as you can see from the individuals that are here under the tree, this is much taller. The pillar is about 100 feet high. So you have, char you have um, kind of Calhoun glowering over everybody. And um, it would be much harder to um, attack him. However, one woman um, noted that she, when she was a girl in the 1930s, she learned that Calhoun did not like black people. And um, she and her friends would try to sneak around and throw rocks at the, stat, at the monument and um, to indicate how the displeasure that they um, had being looked over, um, kind of surveyed by a person who um, thought that Black people were unequal. So this was risky, but it also shows something of the inner life of, um, of Black Southerners. Another aspect was um, where we see some of these hints about how Black people viewed the Confederate monuments is the Robert E. Lee figure. So this, this shows just how mammoth this figure was. This is in Richmond, Virginia. And um, it would be the first Confederate monument on what would become uh, Monument Avenue, where there's a whole, um, in, until they were taken down in 2020, um, a whole like series of monuments honoring um, Robert E. G Confederate general statesmen like Jefferson, Jefferson Davis and um, others. And so this was a massive monument. And 
Uh, interestingly, in that, as you see in the very back, um, two African American men um, putting doing hard work, like putting up a monument, would require in the Southern order that Black people participate, even if they opposed it. Um, John Mitchell, who was the editor of the Richmond Planet, an African American newspaper, um, was fairly um, circumspect in his criticism, but he made it, he threw some barbs. Um, one of the things, um, John Mitchell was not only a um, editor, but he was also in the, he served in the late 1890, in the 1890s on the, uh, as an alderman for Richmond, which was um, black representation the city would soon end after, after he um, ended his office. But in the Richmond Planet, um, he noted that when the monument was being put up, he said it's really interesting that all we see is Confederate flags. There's Confederate flags e everywhere. As he says in the, you might not be able to read this, he goes, on every hand could be seen the stars and bars. Nowhere in all this procession was there a United States flag. The emblem of the Union had been left behind the rebel yell reinforced by a glorification of the lost cause was everywhere manifest. Implicit in this for his readers would say that black people, the black Richmond, Richmond residents were the people who are actually maintaining the US. They were the ones not, who did not celebrate, celebrate rebels or treasonous individuals. And his, um, critique about the emergence of the Confederate flag in, in public is also something that would be, that will also kind of just shift to a little bit is how black people regarded the Confederate flag. So clearly Rit, um, Mitchell and his reader is telling his readers, these, this is not the action of loyal Americans. Um, they might be doing a lot of things, but they aren't necessarily um, celebrating what it means to be part of the United States and presumably the values of the United States, equality for all, for example. Um, so from the 1890s, uh, 1880s and 1890s onwards, the Black press consistently critiqued the um, willingness of white Southerners to show the stars and bars um, to say why why um, show a Confederate battle flag if that would if that country was defeated and doesn't exist. So I'm going to take a big leap right now and go to another um, after World War II, there was you see an emergence of the Confederate battle, battle flag used to signal opposition to civil the civil rights movement. And you also see it being adapted by white Southerners, everyday Southerners, to express what they consider to be the sentiment of the South. So this is in 1948 was the first time that the, a breakaway group of Democrats organized the Southern Rights Party. Um, sometimes they're popularly known as Dixiecrats. And Strom Thurmond, who would later serve in the Senate and oppose civil rights pretty much any time he could, was the presidential candidate and Fielding Wright was the vice presidential candidate. So um, in addition to kind of general US emblems like the Statue of Liberty, um, you also have emblems of the Confederate flag. So this is an image of uh, college students, looks like they're all guys, all men at the college students. And you can see they're waving various not only the Confederate battle flag, a US flag, and in the white flag is another Confederate emblem, probably not as well known as the, as the um, Confederate battle flag. So um, for, for African-Americans who were usually opposed to the Southern Democrats, because that was basically saying that the push towards civil rights, acknowledgement of black civil rights should be um, should be halted and Jim Crow segregation and de disenfranchisement of black people should continue. And I'll just note 1940, there's no secret why this broke, breakaway party emerged in 1948. 1948 was the year in which Harry S. Truman um, did two major things that angered um, 
angered many white Southern Democrats. Um, the first was that he um, he endorsed a president. Well, he endorsed he endorsed a presidential platform for the Democratic Party that supported civil rights. So this is a huge change from the 1890s Democratic Party platform state uh, state platforms, at least which which basically said in so many words that support white white supremacy. So for Truman, a Southerner. This was often seen as that he was kind of giving up his, um, he was being a, tr a traitor to his people. Um, the other big change that Truman authorized was that he um, he um, may, had a presidential order authorizing the desegregation of the military. So after, um, so these, this was a really an early shaking up of the white democratic alliance. Um, and it was also a reason why some Black people were begin, were shifting from the Democratic Party to the Republic, from the Republican Party, I'm sorry, to the Democratic Party. So um, just wanted to show a few examples of how African Americans were protesting the, um, the widespread use of the Confederate flag. This was a, um, I'm quoting from the Indianapolis Recorder because I've done a lot of research in Indiana, Indiana history. I'm really used to using the Indianapolis um, news, historic newspaper database. And also I just wanted to give a sense of how widespread these, um, these uh, critiques were. The Indianapolis Recorder is a fine a newspaper, an African-American newspaper, but it didn't have nearly the spread of say the Chicago Defender or the Pittsburgh Courier or the Baltimore Afro-American. Um, so it's it's a newspaper that's in the mix, but I think it kind of represents where a lot of people, the news that circulated amongst Black America. So um, this was the American Council on Human Rights, which is a coalition of the Divine Nine, Black fraternities and sororities, which were really launching a protest um, hopefully lobbying um, representatives and elected officials to stop the general spread of the, the display of the Confederate battle flag. And as they said, they want the public to, they want they, they're asking people in the South and border states, by which they usually mean Kentucky and Missouri um, and Maryland, and to encourage the public, quote, to fly the American flag as a symbol of faith and ultimate victory of the principles of equality of citizenship for all without regard to race or color in the United States. And I think after the, so after the um, World War II and particularly with the Holocaust, many, many, many African American civil rights organizations started saying it is time for the US to support American values equality and to repudiate um, racism, which they um, tied to um, Nazism and assuming people understood what that, what that, where that had led. Um, this is the images, some of them, which are probably fairly, um, you might be familiar with. Um, the Little Rock Nine, nine high school student, black high school students who were involved in integrating or desegregating Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, the image on the left is when is after the uh, federalization of the National Guard. So these young women are being brought to school under military escort for their own safety. And the one image on the right, you might be familiar with um, Elizabeth Eckford, the um, young woman in white who and who's wearing sunglasses who was being hectored by and intimidated and menaced by these students and adults who were following her, yelling things at her and so on. Now, what I want to point out is that the um, Indianapolis um, recorder noted that not only was, were people um, harassing these students, but they were also engaging what they thought with what the recorder editorial calls un-American activities. So for example, they were waving the Confederate battle flag. They refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They refused to hang the American flag. They glorified the Confederate flag. 
and all the shamefulness for which it stood, the flag, alarming interpretations of a state's rights, all of the things point to a critical temperament which cannot be ignored. And so what they're painting for with what the African-American critics are painting a picture is saying that you have governors defying the federal government. They are waving flags that um, are of, of secessionists who actually were treasonous to the US. They're raised, so trying to say that the civil rights activism is not just a Southern thing. It isn't just something that affects black people but it affects the nation as a whole. And um, many people aren't aware, but these protests against the Little Rock Nine continued the whole time they were in school. And so this is a protest um, in which Orville Favos is um, at the microphone and could see um, support, his supporters are right up close and a prominent um, Confederate battle flag in the background. And it, so you see, opponents to civil rights activists being um, using the Confederate battle flag. Um, Governor George Wallace of uh, Alabama also kind of raised this to a new level. Um, he won election in 1963 on the I-2 and Alabama on the promise of what he said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow and segregation forever. So he um, had some, he was coming to a confrontation with the Kennedy administration over his refusal to allow desegregation in the University of Alabama. Um, there were two black students, Vivian Malone and James Hood were poised to enter that university. And this, um, he had a consultation with Attorney General Robert Kennedy and the day he had a consultation, he rose the Confederate naval flag, the naval jack on the Capitol. Um, so it was actually flying higher than the US flag. And, um, and he just left it up for the rest of his administration and subsequent governors followed that. Um, so in this image is in June, 1963, when Favis is saying, I'm never going to allow black people in the um, command, the, uh, I think there's a general of the National Guard, which had been federalized. So it was no longer Alabama's ordering Faubus to step aside. Faubus will eventually step aside and Vivian Malone and James Hood will be admitted. But Alabama is gonna continue flying, flying the Confederate flag over its capital until 1993 after several law, um, lawsuits. So, um, Wallace ran for president. Um, he showed very well in some northern states, including Indiana. But this is an image of from Floor in Tallahassee, where his fans, his supporters are also, amongst other things, they're waving this, the Confederate battle flag. And in the these images from the march from Selma to Montgomery show just how the flag was being, how these flags were being used by the, um, by the civil rights marchers who often had an abundance of US flags. And part of this was an appeal for protection for further action from the federal government. Whereas those people who were har harassing um, the protesters use the Confederate battle flag. You'll see it when there's protests for small children desegregating schools. Um, lots of, sometimes it's used with a swastika, but it's, um, it's not, not subtle. So I wanna just um, show a, little, a few images of how the Confederate monuments actually emerged as a site of protest in, um, for civil rights um, activists. So in 19, as you may know, their um, Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University was, um, its most famous leader was Booker T. Washington. It was in Alabama. Um, and not surprisingly, like most Southern, many, many Southern towns, Tuskegee had a Confederate uh, monument in its town. And the Confederate monument and the park around it was known for decades as a whites only area. This changed in 1966. 
1966, January 1966, a former student from Tuskegee um, University was shot and killed by a white man. And this shows um, a protest that was being held by um, professors, but also many Tuskegee students. Right now they're having a sit-in at the monument. So they're literally occupying white space. They are so overcome in their grief and anger about what happened to, um, the, to their classmate. Um, his name was Sammy Young. So this would eventually disperse after a few days, this protest would disperse. But in December, 1966, an all white jury found that uh, acquitted the man who killed Aunt Sammy Young. And the students kind of marched that night um, to the monument, to the square, and they daubed it with black paint. Um, some, you might be able to see, barely see black power, um, but people were feeling very kind of heady after this because this is literally transgressing yet again a, a white, whites only space. So just to give you a sense that the protests were not only these very large in the South, in a in Indiana, in Muncie, Indiana, every town in Indiana says Muncie's often known, um, there was a high school called Southside High School. It was built in the 60s and um, to accommodate the beginning of the baby boom. And it, as the South Side, they adopted the mascot of the rebels. And in, in addition to the US flag, they flew a Confederate flag. And this caused a fair amount of problems. So in 1969, there was basically a, kind of a, what people call in the newspaper, the Indianapolis records, recorder called racial violence. It was black young men against white young men kind of fighting about this, white, many of the white men de, uh, defending the Confederate flag. Um, so one of the, um, the, the Confederate, the uh, recorder notes that students had, Black students hated the fact that they went to a school that was just called Southside High School. It didn't, you know, it wasn't called Jefferson Davis High School, but that the school board, school had gone out of its way to celebrate the Confederacy. And, um, and it, they, the reporter notes it causes a fair amount of trouble and um, the students actually boycotted class for several days with the support of their parents. So they set up alternative schools, kind of modeled on freedom schools, which were going on in the South. And students from Ball State University helped teach that. And um, the newspaper quotes, to black people, the Confederate flag has the same connotations as the Nazi swastika holds for Jewish people, slavery and oppression. Um, and he said that attempts to, to have these symbols discarded have been ignored. This protest eventually died down. There would be continual protests throughout the 1970s, but it wasn't until the school closed in the 1990s that the, um, that the Confederate battle flag and the, um, the rebel's name actually ended. So I wanna just say something a little bit unusual about how some white progressive Southerners attempted to use the Confederate battle flag um, to in anti-racist action. That might sound a little confusing, but it was a, these are very interesting attempts. So this was the proposed logo of the Southern Student Organizing Committee. And it was an attempt by white Southern students who did not join the, say, the, the um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, but saying that they needed to organize white, white Southerners needed to organize white Southerners to support Black civil rights. So this was the image. In some ways, it takes the Black and white handshake. It's a little bit kind of awkwardly rendered um, that, that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other groups had used. But against the stars and bars, this logo actually didn't take off. Um, so these, these pins, these pin back buttons are kind of, they're, they circulated, but the Southern Student Organizing Committee did not adopt them, um, this logo more generally. And it, the, 
the organization uh, ended in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, another interesting attempt of using the, um, of, of this Confederate monu uh, flag being used, the battle flag, was this unusual, remarkable interracial alliance in Chicago in 1969. Um, in Chicago was where the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers was, um, was, head, was headquartered. Um, on your right is Fred Hampton, who was the really charismatic and kind of really an, a strategic genius behind the Black Panthers in Chicago. And one of the things that the Black Panthers did, they built on previous organizing efforts on the basis of class across, inter, across racial lines. Um, largely, this was um, the, the major organizations that were involved in this were the Young Lords, which were largely, um, which was largely Puerto Rican, Chicano activists, as they called themselves, were Mexican American, the, and the Young Patriots. And uh, the two people on the left are members of the Young Patriots. Uh, Bill Preacherman Vesperman has the cowboy hat, and the other fellow has a uh, brown beret, kind of, which is a reference in some way to the Young Lords. Um, you can see that Vesperman um, has a Confederate uh, flag on underneath his, um, on his, on the front of his, his jean jacket. And the Young Patriots were largely people who identified as being Appalachian. Sometimes they called themselves hillbillies and, say, or, and um, were really discouraged with their, uh, what they found in Chicago when they were attempting to migrate, when they migrated north for, um, to, find, to find jobs. They found themselves being um, kind of segregated as Appalachians in certain housing units, um, did not have security, um, fairly dangerous neighborhoods and definitely impoverished nature, neighborhoods. And the tall fellow, the tallest fellow there, Bob Lee, who is a Black Panther, actually started working, made the inroads in talking to the young patriots. And he has some really interesting um, discussions, uh, his reminiscences about what he, being shocked by what he saw in the uptown neighborhood of Chicago where people from Appalachia had settled. And throughout 1969, there was a class-based and not alliance between the Young Patriots, the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, and uh, Chicano activists, as well as some Native American activists. And they called themselves the Rainbow Coalition. So when Jesse Jackson adopted that, he was making a reference to what some people call the first Rainbow Coalition. Um, they, there were several um, really significant statements that came out in the middle of 1969 about class analysis um, and um, interracial alliances, but this alliance really fell apart, apart with Fred Hampton's murder in December 1969. Um, he was, his, where he had been living was tipped off by an FBI informant amongst the Black Panthers. And so many times people talk about this as an effort, as an example of potential of interracial alliance. So 1969 is kind of a, a really kind of interesting um, point here. And I just wanted these images here because the Rivington um, in, the, in the book, the Rivington showcase takes place in 1971. So I just want to, um, these are kind of the things that were, would have been in people's minds. These weren't, um, this wasn't esoteric information for someone, I think, especially someone like Opal, who would have been, um, she's, she's a lot of things that we can talk about, but I think she, she knew and her family knew about what was, about the activism that was occurring throughout the country, especially because she has Southern roots. Um, her family was part of the great migration from the South to the North. So I wanna just end by showing you just a few images of how, um, of how some of these protests, how African-Americans relationship with these images, with these monuments and image and the flag has changed in the 1970s forward. 
So this is the Talladega, this is, a, I'm sorry, the Tuskegee Monument again. And the man in the, for, in the front is Johnny Ford, who had been the mayor of Tuskegee um, in the, I believe in the 1980s and 90s. And one of the things he notes is that he really didn't have the, the political capital to take down the monument. Uh, he thought it was impossible. And he has, after George Floyd's murder, he actually attempted, he attacked the monument. And in Alabama, there are laws protecting monuments and memorials. And so he, um, he said that he wasn't able to take it down as the mayor. He hopes that he would be, that people would be able to take it down now. That monument is still standing. Like many, um, it's, it, was, it is still owned by the United Daughters of the Confederacy who refused to kind of give permission for it to be removed. Um, and these are images of an artist who I think is pretty remarkable, Sonia Clark, who does a lot of work with flags and so on. And she talks, this is one about uh, unraveled persistence. She can meet, re read in many ways. But she's asked a really profound question is why do we remember, why are we, why has the United States remembered the stars and bars, the Confederate battle flag, and not this, this dish rag, which was the Confederate truce flag. So it's in my museum. It is the flag that um, was sent up uh, on, that was sent, that Robert E. Lee ordered to be used to signal a white flag of surrender. And she's done remarkable work with this. Um, she's woven it in many ways, said a replica, and then she made a massive one. It's, I saw it a couple months ago. It's 30 feet long by I think 18 foot feet wide. Um, so she's asked why, why can we not honor this flag and what it could potentially represent? So, I hope that I've been able to give you a little bit of an idea, just a little of some of the creativity, the iconoclasm that Black people and communities have greeted the, um, these Confederate um, symbols. And I just wanted to end with these images because this is Bree, Bree Newsom, who did the remarkable thing of scaling a flagpole to take down the flag, Confederate battle flag that was over the South Carolina Capitol grounds. And this remarkable projection on the Robert E. Lee monument after George Floyd's murder um, with George Floyd's image. And I think that might be a good way for us to enter into a, a discussion. Thank you so much, Modupe, that was amazing. Um, so I wanna invite people to put your questions in the Q&A if you have some. Um, while we're waiting for people to do that, I, I have a question for you as, um, as an expert on this topic and a museum employee. Um, what, what do you think should be done about these monuments? <laughs> this is sort of the, the big question. Um, so I don't, uh, okay, this is me speaking personally. I don't, I think that they do a lot of harm. Stand, as, they're stand, as they're standing. Um, as a museum person, we're tasked with preservation. And so one of the big questions is if we preserve these monuments, how should they be preserved and where should they be preserved? So there are many people who initially, especially in 2015, after the massacre at, in Charleston of Mother Emanuel Church said, these monuments belong in museums. Um, many museum people were kind of concerned because the monuments are big, they're really heavy. Um, but I think probably the more interesting question is if you put them in a museum, how do you, how do they put them there? And what I found really influential is a couple examples. Um, one was in Britain and where they, um, there was a monument that to a slave trader in Bristol that, um, that has been preserved with all of the kind of graffiti and people damaging it. It was displayed in a temporary exhibit face down as if he, because this guy was actually pushed into a canal in Bristol. 
um, face down, kind of indicating his, the fall. Um, because I think that indicates that it isn't just kind of trying to preserve the original intent, but maybe to preserve the, the, the protest that brought it down, but also the, the decades of protests that were before it. So that's kind of where I, I'm leaning to, but um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, we do have a question. Um, are there any monuments or has there been Confederate flag instances in the Pacific Northwest that you know of? I am not sure. I would probably check with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Their reports and maps are probably the best instance. They're probably the most up-to-date database of um, Confederate monuments. Um, but I do know, for example, like one of the things when I was living in Indiana, there was this surprise. There, there was a Confederate monument in Indianapolis. And um, once people started doing research, they found that up until I think World War II, there were and Memorial Days, there were Memorial Day celebrations there. Um, I gr grew up in Iowa and there are several Confederate monuments there, um, but those were put in in the er late 1990s, early 2000s and kind of the nationalizing of this idea of the Confederacy as you know, just rebellion um, and of an expression of independence. Right, yeah. Um, okay, uh, someone says, I was disturbed to read in the Washington Post that the neo-Nazis in Germany have adopted the stars and bars as their unofficial flag because swastikas are outlawed in Germany. How have blacks and white racists reacted to this? Um, so with white racists, I'm not an expert in that. I would probably, again, look at the Southern Poverty Law Center, or there are some extraordinary groups in Europe who've been monitoring um, fascist, neo-fascist, and um, new right movements. So I would kind of really look at this. And um, there's an interest, a really actually very great website called Unicorn Riot. Unicorn Riot that is out of Minneapolis that does a lot of monitoring of, of hate groups and in is one of its kind of beats. Um, you know, I, I, your question is really important and I, I do not know how um, people in everyday Germany and people in the US have responded to the globalization of the Confederate monument. Um, there is a fairly active group of Black Germans um, in, um, in Germany who have been experiencing a, a fair amount of harassment as well as, as um, the small Jewish community in Germany. So I think this year kind of that question indicates that we need to be paying a lot more kind of global attention to this. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, uh, what should we replace these monuments with? Are monuments to individuals still our best option going forward? Oh, this is so complicated. Um, so this is just me um, speaking. Um, I think one of the things that um, I would say is that I personally like the idea of leaving empty, empty plinths there. So just having the um, the monument without having the 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 um, the structure of the monument without the bronze or the stone on top, and uh, I did see in in Baltimore one. I don't think Baltimore intends to leave these plants empty, but it was kind of striking because you can tell an absence. You can tell, I think it was the Roger B. Tawney monument. Um, I definitely, you know, I think there's, I think, I think honoring individuals is important. I think that, um, I think that kind of the idea of the, uh, these monuments is, into, is saying, what are our ideals as, as, a, as a society? 
And this is what's so insidious about the Confederate monuments, because it said like, that's the ideal is the lost cause and so on. So I, um, I think there's individuals, but I also think there's amazing monuments to communities. So for example, in Minneapolis, there is an attempt to commemorate a community, a black community, that the Rondo neighborhood that was basically plowed through by, I think, Interstate 35 there. And so part of it is mourning, you know, saying there was structural violence here, but some of it is also honoring, honoring the people who live there. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Um, okay, one more question. Um, the quote in the newspaper that was shown when the person indicated that Confederate flags are as upsetting to Black people as swastikas are to Jewish people, do you feel that sentiment is still true today? It, it feels to me that Confederate flags are much more tolerated in the U.S. than swastikas are, but non-Black people may not be as aware of the harm. Uh, I think people are, I think that comment is spot on. I, um, I'll just, I mean, I feel that I'll just say personally, when I see a Confederate flag, when I see it displayed in the window, a person's window, our car, I my assumption is that that person, in addition to all the other reasons why they might be displaying it, let's say they like the band Molly Hatchet, they might they might do feel like it's heritage. They're also telling me that they are endorsing on some level white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that our interaction as a black woman would might it might be okay, but it, it it's it's not it's not leading me kind of to say that there it, it tells me that there's some barriers there at the at the minimum. But I also I think that what this questioner said is absolutely right is that for many 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 people who are not as aware of the 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 history often see it as kind of weird or like it's it's kind of it might be southern or just actually just not know about it which I think is the case with many immigrants mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of confederate there's a lot of confusion with how obnoxious it is and how hateful with its ubiquity and um, so mm -hmm. I think that was a really um, wonderful observation yeah um, one more, which I think you sort of did answer a little bit. Um, how many Confederate monuments are still on display publicly and where do they tend to be located in particular areas and states? So um, <laughs> I, I should know the number, but I don't. Um, so there are, um, again, I would go to the Southern Poverty Law Centers. What, I think they have an interactive database that shows the monuments that have been taken down and those that are still remaining. Um, the first wave of monument building um, in the from the 1880s through the 19, 1930s was almost, almost all in the South, not all of it, um, but most of it was in the South, but it also included states that were not part of the Confederacy. So Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, um, where also have a fair a lot of Confederate monuments. Um, much more recently, and starting in the 1990s, the Sons of the Confederate Veterans, as opposed to the United Daughters of the Confederate Veterans, started kind of basically a campaign encouraging local historical societies to think about having Confederate monuments outside of the South. And so you'll see another kind of rise in Confederate monuments in places like Montana, um, Iowa, Indiana. And those were usually sponsored by local historical societies as opposed to the city, which is what you'll see in with the United Daughters of Confederacy. And um, I think definitely they kind of, it, it builds on the ubiquity of the Confederate monument, and as a as a relatively as a um, as an important symbol, but on some level also being seen as benign. So um, those are those are where you, you'd see a lot the Confederate monuments. A lot of them, like the one in in Tuskegee, um, a lot of states 
have, have several Southern states have laws against taking down Confederate money, uh, monuments. But there's also the United Daughters of the Confederacy does not want to cede control of the um, of the monuments. But there's also many places where they've given it to say the, the decision of the Board of Supervisors and so on. And if there if you're in an area where there's probably voter suppression or non representation of the community, those elected bodies in themselves may not be representing the communities there. So it's a very, very complicated, intensely local struggle about what happens to these monuments. Right. Let's let's just end on, you know, what what can we what can we do to sort of get involved and, and keep this conversation moving forward? And I mean, it's true, you know, we're in Oregon, maybe we're not, you know, there's not a proliferation of Confederate monuments here, but what do you think we can do just as concerned citizens? Well, I think one of the really interesting things about the activism in the 2000s, um, which it isn't the same as the Rainbow Coalition, but there's been so much interesting activism amongst Black groups, LGBTQ group, plus groups, um, uh, Native Americans, um, is kind of being aware of the public symbols. So although there may not be Confederate monuments. There are some, there's no doubt symbols of, um, of, of actions that cannot be defended um, in most public, in most, you know, in most states and municipalities. So for example, in Richmond, um, youth activists really encouraged um, the, um, the city to consider not only a, um, the Confederate monuments, I think this was a high school kid who kind of brought this to the city council, but also the monuments to um, Sakagawea, the Shoshone woman, um, which really shows her in a kind of strangely passive way as if she were taking directions from Lewis and Clark, as well, as, which is obvious in that park in Charlottesville, it was also about, um, it's about manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. And um, so th I think that is one of the aspects. The others is kind of thinking about the public spaces in much more kind of um, broad terms. Like what, what do we want in our public spaces? Who do, we, who do we want to, who do we want to honor and learn from? Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's very inspiring. <laughs> yeah, it's very, I mean, the community building around this is really extraordinary and I've learned so much. I've had many, many of my ideas have been changed by talking and listening to people. Yeah, let's hope those young people too keep on keeping on. Yes, <laughs> but young people, I'm not saying that you sh you're the only, yet you're the only no. on everything. I think I think it's a public, I, um, many young people in my family say, I you know, we appreciate you noticing us, but don't expect us to solve everything. Right. They're exactly right. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. It's on all of us. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think that's an, that's all we have time for tonight. Thank you, Modube, for a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot. I'm sure we all did. Um, and really appreciate you tying it back into the book, which is amazing. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. It was my pleasure. Have a great time. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.